All right, as I find my disappointingly empty coffee mug, I'm gonna go through this Ojibwe Lifestyles graphic organizer, as well as the reading for it. You'll find the reading is linked on the direction slides. As we're typing in here, everything's gonna glow yellow for us. And that is super helpful. We would like that, that's preferred. Your boxes will also expand as you're doing your typing, which is gonna be nice. There is about 14 questions. After the questions, I'm gonna tell you where inside of the article you can look to find the answer. Some of them are going to be specific for like individual seasons and others are going to be kind of throughout everything. This one is just us talking about it. The questions that we're gonna be listening for, the Anishinaabe people are sometimes referred to as, and so I know I've gotta to listen to two other names that the Anishinaabe are referred to. Describing how the Ojibwe used Minnesota's natural resources, this would be best done after I do all of the article and after I do the reading. What is the Misabe? What's his role in Ojibwe legend? I'll find that in the spring section. Why did the Ojibwe process maple sap into sugar, not maple syrup? Why is maple sugaring such hard work? Explain why maple sugar was such an important food to the Ojibwe. What's the preferred way of fishing for the Ojibwe? Why would you eat a morel mushroom or cattail root? This one is in summer, but it's also an opinion question. So it wants to know what you would do. Several fruits and nuts you can find in a Minnesotan forest in the north without refrigeration. Why would they preserve? How would they preserve most of their food? What are two reasons as to why summer is super important? Why does the young Ojibwe hunter wait until his fourth bite to taste the rabbit? And talking about three sentences comparing my culture's family, uh, my, my, my cultural family food to the traditional Ojibwe cultural family Ojibwe food. All right, here we go. Everything is inside of the reading. I'm gonna go through it pretty much with a stop in here. Ojibwe Lifeways. What can we learn today from early inhabitants of Minnesota who gathered and hunted wild food to survive? And this one's by Anton Troyer. This was published in the uh, Minnesota Conservation Magazine. For hundreds of years, Ojibwe Indians thrived in the land we call Minnesota. They survived cold, harsh winters without modern inventions such as electricity, central heating, and grocery stores. How did they do it? The secrets to Ojibwe life began with a deep respect for the land and its natural resources. Ojibwe people, also known as Anishinaabe or Chippewa, right here is where I'm looking there. Right, first question. Believe that every animal and plant is a being that should be treated with respect. They used tobacco as a way to show the creator that they had not, that they were not taking the life of a plant or animal for fun, but because they were going to use it for food, lodging, or medicine. Ojibwe people did a good job of harvesting the things they needed without using them all. They took only enough fish and other animals, grouse, deer, rabbits, moose, elk, and caribou to feed their families. Another secret to Ojibwe survival was the strong belief in hard work. Fishing and hunting can be fun, but there's no guarantee of success. You must try and try again to catch a fish or shoot a deer or snare a rabbit. Imagine hunting and fishing to keep your family from going hungry. Ojibwe people worked hard to survive. Over time, the Ojibwe gained special knowledge about the land and waters and the plants and animals that grow there. They learned the best ways to gather and use Minnesota's natural resources. These traditional life ways learned by trial and error have been passed from adults to children, generation after generation. Many people still practice them. So over here, I know I've got a mention about what's going on with what tobacco is used to honor. And this is a picture of some wild rice happening here, dancing on the wild rice. You can see there's a bean that's covered in a bag to protect the wild rice, make sure it's nice and clean, and you can stomp it to 
which breaks the wild rice in the kernel. Spring it, the sugar bush time. This is the author's daughter holding a jar of maple syrup. According to Ojibwe legend, a long time ago, there was a hungry man stumbling through the woods in the spring, and he grew so weak that he collapsed. Thinking he might die, he offered tobacco and begged the creator for help. Looking up, he saw a tall, hairy being that the Ojibwe called the Misabe. The Misabe held a large knife and used it to cut his leg. As the wound started to bleed, the Misabe transformed into a giant tree, and the blood turned into maple syrup maple sap, which began to flow from the tree trunk. The hungry Ojibwe man tasted the sweet liquid. It worked like medicine, making him feel strong again. He showed the miracle of maple sap to other Ojibwe. Everyone agreed it was a sacred gift that marked the end of the starving times in winter, I'm back up at the top, and the beginning of a new season of life. The Ojibwe people learned that sap could be made from the maple trees, Sap. Maple sap must be harvested in spring when the sap is going up the trunk during warm days and back down during cold nights. The gatherers made a small hole in the bark to drain the sap, then collected it in birch bark baskets. In spring, Ojibwe families gathered in a sugar bush, a forest with lots of maple trees. They needed to collect about 40 gallons of sap to make one gallon of maple syrup, and even more to make maple sugar. They hollowed out a log, filled it with maple sap. Then they heated log rocks in a fire and dropped them into the trough, the hole in the log, to boil the sap. The sap had to boil for many hours until it thickened into syrup and eventually turned into a light brown sugar. Sugar was easier to keep and carry than syrup. One family might pack out hundreds of pounds of sugar from the sugar book every spring. It would be way easier, I think, to carry something that's a grain, like a sugar grain, than it would be to carry a bunch of liquid, especially hundreds of pounds. For the Ojibwe, maple sugar could mean the difference between life or death. People sometimes went hungry in the winter, and maple sugar provided this from the previous spring, provided calories and nutrients. Maple sugar and syrup have been found to be superfoods that fight disease. Today, Ojibwe people usually use a more modern equipment to make the syrup, but they still see it as a gift from the forest. Here we have the process of the maple sugar sap. One thing that we notice is they're drilling into a tree, and this is going to be the south side of the tree, because they need the sap to run up the tree and then down. And when it comes down, it drains out of that hole that they're drilling into the tree. Pound it in the tap, and that tube will collect it, and it's boiled on the stove to process that all down. There's another presentation inside of Google Classroom that we'll use, and we'll just talk about uh, what it's like to make maple syrup and bet someone in the of our pens. Summertime. In summertime, wild food is more plentiful, and it's easier to find than it is during spring and winter. Animals such as bears have awakened from hibernation and birds such as ducks and geese have returned from migration. Fish are abundant, and the Ojibwe use just about every way imaginable to catch them. Nets, spears, traps, and hook and line. They discovered that nettles, uh, uh, kind of like a hook, could be picked and turned into strong, thin strings that they wove into nets. One net could take hundreds of hours to make, and one storm could destroy a net and all that work. But people kept making nets because the nets made it easier to catch a lot of fish. The Ojibwe took and kept all the species of the fish. Walleye, whitefish, suckers, sturgeon, and even eel pout. They boiled some of the fish and smoked the rest to save for eating later. Mushrooms and other forest plants become ripe and ready to harvest. Ojibwe people picked mushrooms and they knew that they could safely eat. They also knew which mushrooms could make them sick. The Ojibwe realized that cattail root made a great food. They dug them up, boiled them, and ate them like potatoes. They also dug wild onions and picked grapes, butternuts, hazelnuts, and many kinds of berries. Since they didn't have freezers or refrigerators, since they didn't have fridges or refrigerators, 
They dried and stored most of their foods. A family would often pick hundreds of pounds of blueberries, cranberries, choke cherries, and other wild fruit, and then lay them in the sun's dry. They stored their dried food in deep pits in the ground to keep it away from wild animals. The pits were lined with rocks to drain away the water. The Ojibwe worked hard in summer when it was easiest to get food because they knew it would not always be plentiful in other seasons. As with their harvests in all seasons, they offered tobacco as a sign of respect and a spiritual offering for their food. They were careful not to make too much so there would be more for later. That's a nice picture there, all wild rice. Wild rice is probably the most important food of all the first Ojibwe in Minnesota. Tribal elders tell legends about a time more than a thousand years ago when their prophets told the people to travel west from their ancestral homelands on the Atlantic coast to the land where food grows on the water. And that land was in the wild rice country of Minnesota, Wisconsin, Michigan, Ontario, and Manitoba. The Ojibwe discovered how to harvest and process the wild rice. Here's the amazing discovery and how it still works today. Wild rice grows in shallow water near shore. People wait until the rice is very ripe before they gather it because it yields the most food. But a bad storm or a small strong wind can blow the ripe rice into the water so people work hard to gather it. A two-person team goes onto the water in a birch bark canoe. One person stands and uses a long pole to push and propel the canoe through the wild rice stalks. The other person uses two knocking sticks one to bend stocks over the canoe and one to tap them so the rice falls into the canoe. When the canoe is full of rice, the team comes ashore. Before the rice is ready to cook, it must be processed. First, it's spread out to dry. Next, it's roasted or parched. Parched is another term for roasted. Over a fire. The parched rice is placed in a wood-lined pit in a person jigs or dances on the rice to separate the hulls, which are the outside coverings, from the kernels, those small seeds of rice. Somebody fans or winnows the rice into the wind. You throw it up and then the wind blows all of the, uh, the rice and gets that all separated. The rice is heavier and the rice falls down into your pot. In the past, most families processed hundreds of pounds of rice every year. The Ojibwe made tobacco offerings before and after the rice harvest. Great rice beds like the lower rice lake on the White Earth Reservation still attract hundreds of ricers with their family. Men, women, and children rice, and in the evenings, the rice camps ring with the sound of people singing and playing modern games. Winters, snaring rabbits. Ojibwe families come together in the wind, wild rice harvest and ceremonies in the fall, but the winter they spread out again to make it easier to get food during the cold months. Ojibwe people fish through the rice, through fish through the ice, not the rice, ice. And they trapped for beaver in both the meat or the pelts. They used the stored wild rice, the berries and the maple sugar to survive. They invented many techniques for hunting, trapping and snaring wild game. A favorite food of the Ojibwe was the snowshoe hare. Although they were happy to shoot rabbits, it could be hard to do with a bow and arrow and even with a gun. Because snowshoe hares are predictable creatures, their paths are easy to see in the snow. The Ojibwe found the best way to capture them was snaring. A small fiber rope was made into a noose about the size of a human fist, placed on the rabbit trail. When a rabbit came down the trail, its head would go through the noose and it would become trapped. But today, Ojibwe people still use wire snares rather than the rope made from natural fibers then the purpose there is the wire is smoother and it will snare quicker which causes less pain for the rabbit hopefully when ojibwe people killed they offered tobacco to the animal thanking it to give its life to provide food they used all parts of the rabbit the meat was eaten along with the heart and the liver the stomach contents were saved and used for medicine the hide could be used for lining moccasins, or they might cut the rabbit skin in spirals so the long, thin strips could be curled into fur tubes that you would then weave together to make a double-sided fur blanket. When an Ojibwe boy or girl kills his first or her first rabbit, friends and families hold a huge feast. 
The rabbit is roasted or boiled, and the hunter is offered a spoonful of meat. But the hunter has to refuse the first bite and say, No, I'm thinking of the children who have nobody to provide for them. Then they offer the hunter a second bite, and he again refuses, saying, No, I'm thinking of the elders who cannot get into the woods to hunt for themselves. They offer a third bite. The hunter again refuses. No, nope, I'm thinking of my family, my community, and the people who come here today to support me. The hunter is offered a fourth bite. Then he or she continues. The killing of a rabbit marks the first transition from childhood to adulthood, from someone who only eats food to one who also can provide it. It's an introduction to the basic Ojibwe teachings of food and survival. The Ojibwe survived in Minnesota woods for countless generations because they developed a special knowledge, culture, and respect for the natural world. And in spite of many changes in our modern society, a lot of people, a lot of Ojibwe people still carry on these traditions. If you would like to learn more about the traditional Ojibwe culture and history, you can look for books like Ojibwe in Minnesota, everything you wanted to know about Indians but were afraid to ask. You can also look for traditional skills workshops, our local community and library, tribal programs or universities, or visit any of the great displays at Minnesota's historic sites or our local historical society. That was a good article. Learned a lot.